really good, mm -hmm. really, really bright guys. Generally speaking, uh, more independent now, but they've all been Democrats, staunch Democrats, mm -hmm. I think, except maybe one of them. Um, and they're all experts uh, in different fields and all friends. David Friedberg is one of them. And I was listening to the the podcast um, and they asked David a question. Now, David used to work for Monsanto um, and uh, he doesn't work there anymore, but he believes in, you know, Monsanto and, you know, blah, 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 think GMOs and et cetera, et cetera. If you're against GMOs, don't dismiss him because I, I got my facts from him on the stats but uh, we're not talking GMOs. We're just talking about looking at the market and what is really happening. So when you're looking at food, understand that 15% of all global calories come from wheat and rice. 25%. I'm sorry, 15%. One third of all of our wheat comes from Russia and Ukraine. We're supposed to be planting crops all around the world right now for wheat. Not happening in uh, much of Russia, not happening anywhere in Ukraine. Next stat you need to understand. Our food supply, you know how uh, the cars had just in time. Our production lines were all just in time. And that's why we can't make cars because there are parts that are sitting somewhere, you know, crossing the ocean, sitting on a dock someplace. The whole supply chain has broken down because it's just in time. It arrives just in time to put it into the car. When you have a disruption, it just bogs everything up and unclogging it. We don't even know if we can really unclog it and get it started again, but it's going to take years to do it. That's, that's the supply chain for stuff. The supply chain for food is 90 days. We have 90 days worth of food in the supply chain. That's from the grocery store to the garden and everything in between. If it stops, we stop, let's say we just, for some reason, stopped all farming, we would have 90 days left of food worldwide, okay? 25% of all global production is food. We're about to lose 12% of production, that means we're losing half of our food supply of wheat. Half of our wheat food supply. This is going to hit places like Africa first. And it's going to hit places of poverty unlike anything we've ever seen. 800 million people currently on earth live below 1,200 calories per day. So you know... The Germans would not allow Jews to have more than 600 calories a day. So they are only double the amount of calories that the Jews got during the Holocaust. And we all remember what they looked like. If they're at 1,200 calories today and they're in, um, in places that are poor, which they most likely are, those calories will be either cut off or greatly reduced. Now, the bigger problem is fertilizer and energy. The energy price to run the tractors, to run the trucks, to run everything else. And the price of phosphorus and, and uh, potassium, potash, and nitrogen. Those are the three major things we use to make fertilizer. Natural gas, 90% of ammonia is made from natural gas. Prices in natural gas have doubled and in some places gone up 4x. It's gone from $200 a ton 
to $1,000 a ton. Phosphorus, 10% of the phosphorus from Russia and 20 to 25% of all of the potash comes from Russia. It's now been banned in Russia. They cannot sell it. We cannot buy it. They said, oh, you're going to cut us off at the bank? Great, we'll cut you off on this. Potassium is up to $700. Phosphate went from $250 to $700. This is causing so much stress on the farmers that farmers now all around the world are not planting their fields. They are reducing the acreage because without fertilizer, you're not growing much. So why plant all those fields? It's not going to be a good year, they're thinking. So as, they, as fertilizer goes up, they pull more and more acres. So far, the price of corn has doubled. Soybeans, wheat skyrocketing. The strategic food reserves in some parts of the world are now opening. We better have perfect weather all over the world. Just because if things continue the way they are and don't turn around quickly and we can't get fertilizer, hundreds of millions of people will experience famine by the end of the year. We need to do everything we can to support our farmers. We need to understand what's coming and you need to have a garden, plant some seeds, live by a farm and help them, or start storing food now. More on this in a second. Rising fuel prices are taking a toll on small businesses, owners from everything from furniture retailers to swimming pool service companies are trimming their services and revising contracts because the financial hit is, uh, is getting worse and worse and worse. Um, uh, keeping store owners wide awake at night, trying to figure out what are we going to do? Uh, well, there's a couple of things that we, we should do. First of all, let me go back to food for a second. Um, the governments around the world are buying up large swaths of food right now. The commodity price is going up, uh, not just because of traders, but because gover- governments are trading and governments are like, um, we're going to buy our corn right now. And first in first out, uh, countries like, um, that are in Africa, they're going to have a really hard time. They're not going to get the food that they desperately need, but neither are other countries as well. We're all going to take a real hit on this, especially if we don't have good weather. If we, you know, we don't have fertilizer, We should, as a nation, uh, be doing everything we can right now to help the farmer. Everything we can right now to uh, get fertilizer. You know, everybody's worried about uh, the price of inflation for the average person. Okay, that's really bad, and we're all hurting. But if we don't take care of the farmer right now and get him fertilizer and make sure that they can afford the things that they can afford... Uh, or they have to afford, our inflation is the least of our problems. It will be shortages next year. Um, now, they are buying, governments are buying up uh, food, but governments all over the world now are also, while they're doing that, telling you not to hoard. And I'm, I'm telling you also not to hoard, but I am telling you to prepare for your family and then others that will be hungry. We have to help each other through this. There are going to be people who just can't make it, um, uh, and they'll have to bring another skill. It's going to be barter, I guess, but we're just going to have to help each other. If you can grow food, plant this spring. Um, Anything you can do to ease the burden on your family and others, do it. When you go to a store... If you are going in and you're going to buy macaroni and cheese and you only need one box, buy two, put one away, use the other one. When that one box is done, don't reach into the pantry to get it. 
buy a second box. As I showed you just a few minutes ago, just because of inflation, that box a year from now is going to be costing you a lot more money at the store. And when you hit a breaking point, you'll have some food storage. But be careful on what you think your breaking point is, uh, because real, real trouble is coming. And we have to be prepared. And we have to be prepared to help others. That This is, I think, the beginnings of the times when I have felt since the beginning with you that you are going to play a role in saving this nation. And I think this is the beginning of it, uh, preparing for those in need. And it is going to be really, really, really hard because you're going to be like, I prepared, they didn't. I know, I know. But we're in this together. you got to take care of your family first, but we're in this together. Um, that doesn't mean <laughs> that... Uh, it doesn't mean you should tell the world what you're doing because governments will come in and uh, they'll start to uh, make it illegal to hoard food. They will uh, start to demonize people first uh, as hoarders. This is a while away, I think, but that's what will happen. So just keep your mouth quiet uh, and nobody needs to know your business. Just urge the people who get it to begin to just store some food uh, for their family and and create a network, if you will, of people who think like you and and really understand what's coming and just help each other, just help each other. So how real do you think the food shortage thing is? I think, think the food shortage in places like India and Africa, I think millions are going to die. Millions will die, probably worse than anything we've ever seen. Oh my God. If this, if the war could, if they come up with a solution today and crops get into the ground, maybe not. But, but it, it will still be a problem because we're not getting fertilizer. So it will be a situation where maybe we, as a as the top market in the world, are able to acquire this stuff, but at higher prices, way higher prices. But uh, uh, down the line. The, the the poorer countries are not even able to acquire it at all. Yeah, I are very, very little. Jeez. It'll all be it'll be Ethiopia on a grand scale. Do you remember what that was like? Oh when, yeah. I remember all the commercials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to the, the We Are the World song out of that. Yeah. And that was not worth it. No. <laughs> I don't know if it solved it. If it did, it's right. still I mean, no offense to yeah. the African people, but I think they would oppose the song over being saved uh, i think they, i think they'd I rather think so. i think they'd rather starve <laughs> might to death be a little <laughs> get a hasty the, generalization I do, I, look i may be speaking for an entire continent here but yeah. i think if they could go <laughs> back to the 80s and they said look will we have generation generations of our people be alive or that stupid song play again they would they would choose uh they would choose to delete the song and and sadly, mm. have a deal with the repercussions of that. Well, we don't have Michael Jackson around to make a song uh, this time. <laughs> That's right. uh, but That's it is screwed. it is going to be bad. It's going to be bad everywhere. And forget everything else. Just know that a twenty five percent of of fertilizer comes from Russia. Just the twenty five percent of global. Just twenty five percent. So what do you do here? Because. Because it's, I think it's easy for us to say that we've done everything wrong. It's, it's easy. But like, look at the effects of what we've talked about with inflation. The things you're talking about, 30 and 40% increases, are nothing compared to if we internalized all of our production in the United States. If we got rid of all of this global trade, our prices would go up way more than 30 or 40%. I mean, you know, you would not see... Your, your TVs are no longer $400 for a 60-inch, I'll tell you that much. All this stuff goes away without the global stuff, tra uh, trade and all of the things associated with it. So the theory going back as, 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 as globalization, uh, not in the nefarious, uh, you know, UN running our lives sort of way, but in the, hey, we're going to trade with countries because we can, we can ha turn up production and certain countries will do certain things well, mm -hmm. others will do others, mm -hmm. we'll all combine our efforts, and this is why you have Walmart and prices are really low there. So that goes in, and one of the theories was, as we saw new countries get into that system, 
those countries tended to moderate. They wanted to be involved in the global trade so they didn't act like psychopaths all the time. So our theory was, if we embrace countries like Russia and like China, uh -huh. they will, over time, be so interested in these markets that they will stop acting like psychopaths. Now, I think we've seen that with those two countries, that has not worked out very well. Mm -hmm. However, you've seen it in other areas, you know, Japan is a good example of it working out pretty darn well. So what do you do? Do you just, do you wait longer to bring them in? Because it seemed like no, we I tried to it's... bring them in as an incentive for them to right. change. And instead of letting them change first and then allowing them in. So I think this is, this is the, the key. Out of 170 countries, 95 do not have on their books, 95 countries do not have on their books, illegal slave trade they have not made slave trade illegal really 95 that's an that's a mind-boggling enormous stat. 95 countries 95 countries have not passed anti-slavery no. now mm -hmm. uh there's a lot of countries probably in that number because i don't know all the countries but there's i'm sure those some that like don't have a problem with of the course, slave trade yes. okay mm -hmm. um however we should set our limits, and this has been common sense for a very, very, very long time. If your government doesn't have the same kind of understanding about human rights, we shouldn't be doing trade with you. And just at a basic level, right? You don't have to match all of our policies, no, but you've got to respect human life. Men yeah. are born to be free. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you enslave people or build concentration camps or have gulags or whatever... No, I don't think we should do business with you. And that's why we're enslaved to these very, very low prices. It's, it's not that we're getting our, um, some, of, some of the stuff we are. It's not like we're, we're hiring people at very low cost and then putting them in slavery. We're getting stuff some places at a very low cost because the cost of living is so low. So they're making a decent wage in for their, their country yes. and for their area. When these country well, a lot of these factories open, they're the line is around, you know, it's a mile long to get jobs correct. in this place because it's the best job available to that country. Correct, community. correct. However, that's not the case in China. Mm. Now there might be people lining up around the block in China to have a <laughs> job here, but they also enslave people. Mm -hmm. So no. Yeah. If your country is so diametrically opposed to our system, no, that would include Saudi Arabia, that would include Iran, that would include Russia, China, North Korea, all of these countries that just don't see the world and people the same way. And I think, too, this this points to another one of the undersold failures of the Biden administration that people are not talking about, which is when Donald Trump was president of the United States, our relationship with india was never better they love donald trump there yeah now they've decided to side with russia mm -hmm. and, and china and china and our option right if we were to lose china as a manufacturing hub our easiest replacement is going to india where it's a little more expensive but not a lot more expensive and if they're a close ally there is some synergy there. We could still probably make some some products at reasonable prices and and help someone who's in the the they always call it the global uh, democracy, the largest global democracy. Uh, India is the biggest country that has some of the trappings of what we would respect as a government, um, and we seem to be losing them right now. And that's that's a big deal. Uh, we're going to lose them. We're going to lose uh, Taiwan. We're going to lose. Mm. Um, possibly the Philippines, we will lose Vietnam, all of those countries that provide low uh, cost labor. We'll lose all of those if we continue down the path we're on. That will leave us with just half the world. Huh. Almost like what the Great Reset is calling for. Mm. They will offer the solution of the end of globalization. You'll hear that. This is the end of globalization. We've got to do things. We got to do things closer to home. And so it will appear to be the end of globalization, but it will not be the end of globalization. It will be what you interpret as more global controls. 
but we'll make stuff closer to home and not with China or Russia. Uh Uh-huh. Really? Because we're currently doing a deal with Iran. (laughs) Just saying.